What is happiness? Do we need to be happy? What's the relationship between happiness and a meaningful life? Hmm. Great big philosophical questions. My guest today, Len Mitchell, may be able to help us out here. Len is a professor of philosophy at Pace University in New York, where he teaches a popular undergraduate course on the philosophy of happiness. And maybe he knows what he's talking about. He came to this field later in life. Len started out as a tax attorney, retiring from Time Warner after a 22-year career in the law. Len, welcome to the latest version. Thank you, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be here with you. You know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that at 50, you left the law and embarked on a six-year PhD program in philosophy. Tell, tell me a little bit about what that process was like. Well, the process was um, kind of evolved naturally in the sense that uh, Time Warner was going through a I had had a very fulfilling career. Um, it's not as long as many at Time Warner, but I uh, enjoyed it and it was um, rewarding in many respects. But there was um, a sense um, that I would like to try other things and do other things. And I probably wouldn't have done it on my own because it would have been too big a step to jump ship. Uh, but there was an opportunity There's uh, that Time Warner offered to people that were in my category who had been at the company for a number of years and were of a certain age, which was 50, which I was, or more, and I was so barely qualified. But I was always admired those people that knew early on in life what exactly they wanted to do. I was not one of those people. I was one of those people that had many different majors in college and was always kind of interested in various things. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't change. This was still something I enjoyed doing, but I thought, what else could I do and uh, enjoy? And that gave me that opportunity to do it. So that's, I took it. Did, um, did you see a, a connection between, was there a connection between law and philosophy or did you like philosophy because it was a break from the law? Well, it was, uh, there is a connection, but I, that's not the reason I went to it. And I, there is a thing called philosophy of law, which I've taught. Um, but it's, um, the thing that was going on in my mind, and I'm not even sure it was, uh, it was um, uh, a, an active thought. It was more of like in the back of my mind is that I grew up in a very religious Southern Baptist, Baptist environment. And the, when in doubt about things, I was always told to, um, to go to the scriptures or pray, and that would be the way to resolve these uh, big life issues. Mm -hmm. That works for a lot of people. It didn't really work for me. I'm not, uh, I'm not downplaying it for those people that does work, but it was always felt like there was, I wanted to approach these big issues from a, with a clear lens without there being any sort of filter. And I thought that they, the philosophy would offer that. I had not studied philosophy before, but I knew enough about it, or at least read about it, and had a had the reputation of allowing for free thinking and free evaluation and clear evaluation of issues. And that's what I wanted to do. So I started taking courses in the undergraduate at Pace, and then um, quickly realized I would like to do uh, do more of this. So I went to a graduate program in New York City. And that's where I got my uh, PhD. So um, you're obviously not from New York. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit about your early years. Well, I, did, I grew up in a small town in Alabama. Um, and um, my dad uh, was the uh, owner and, and um, operator of a Piggly Wiggly store. So I grew hmm. up uh, sacking groceries and stocking shelves and doing all the other things that you do in a Piggly Wiggly supermarket. Uh, it wasn't a big a big one, but it was a reasonable size one. Mm -hmm. So we knew everybody in town, and you know, it was a good childhood, but it was fairly limiting from the standpoint of uh, experience in the world. So I went and I followed my sister, who's five years older, to Auburn University, where I studied, and 
as I mentioned before, I had a lot of different majors, finally finished in business, uh, considered and was in pre-vet medicine for a while. And if I had another life, I'd probably do that. No kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>. Interesting. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was tough and I needed a lot of uh, concentration. At the time, I wasn't completely focused and, um, and, and I didn't wash out, but I did voluntarily left that program and, and did other things. And as I say, finished in business uh, and then went right on to law school. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother-in-law at the time was uh, loved law school and and just raved about it. And um, and uh, he was married to my sister. And I, um, thinking about what to do, I decided to do that. And um, I didn't like it. The first year, particularly, I thought was very repressive and difficult, and which is meant to be, I guess. But it got better. I stayed with it, and, and I finished in law and went on to practice in a small town, larger than my town, but a small town in Alabama, but still felt like that I wanted to, quote, see the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led me to go come to New York. Uh, I knew the reputation of the NYU tax program, and I uh, decided to apply there. I applied to a couple of other schools as well, but I was accepted at NYU, and I was fascinated. I'd been once to New York and to Greenwich Village, and I thought this would be a way to see the world pass in front of you, and I think it's true. Isn't that the <laughs> and, truth? And especially, I think you were at law school in the late 70s? That is correct. Yeah, I, I mean, finished, uh, yeah. New York was a very different place than it is now in the late 70s. I know because I was at NYU undergrad about that uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a bit rough and rough and tumble. Yep. Uh, if you stayed right in the Washington Square area, you know, it was, everything was fine. But if you went too far west or too far east, you could easily get in trouble. Right. So so this was a big this was a big change going from a small town in Alabama to New York. So that was a that was may, maybe a first big change for you. It, it was a big change. Every step along the way was big. You're just going from my small town to Auburn and then from Auburn to Birmingham, where I went to, uh, got my G JD, and then, of course, to to New York was a, a big step. Um, but it was, you know, I just felt that um, I wanted to see what it was like. You know, New York is legendary. Some people love it and some people don't love it. I'm one that did love it and well, I don't live in Manhattan now. My son does, but I can see myself living there again because yep. I, I love the, um, the variety that it offers. Yeah, for sure. What did your family think of all these changes? God, I don't know. <laughs> 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 they thought something's gone haywire with this kid. Uh, but seriously, they were supported. My parents were loving parents, and they never really gave up on me and didn't... Um, didn't discourage me. They, I'm sure, didn't understand what was going on in my mind, but they would. Um, we we never lost uh, contact, and they would come visit. And after I got married and had children, they would come even more regularly, and we would go there. So we have to say that I maintain a, an excellent relation and loving relationship with both my parents, who lived to age um, 86 and 94. Yeah, oh, nice. Um, yeah, and I have one sister, and she uh, still lives in South Alabama and uh, loves to come visit, uh, uh, but probably doesn't understand what motivated me to, to leave Alabama. Well, there are a lot of New Yorkers who share that story, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've run, and I've met so many of them, and the thing about New Yorkers, they talk, the reputation outside of New York, at least where I grew up, was that New Yorkers are unfriendly. I didn't find that to be the case at all. I think, one, especially when you are in an environment where people feel safe, that you're not some sort of threat to them, they get as friendly as anybody, anybody uh, anywhere that I've been. Sure. So, so when you left the law to study, uh, you know, you you said that you started taking some undergraduate courses in philosophy at Pace, or <clears throat> did I get that right. wrong? Yeah. Um, that is correct. Yeah, because I started taking. I went back to. Uh, I went back to school at the age of 56. I started I started oh. an undergraduate program at Columbia, uh, oh. but was also taking the core curriculum courses um, that I found as an adult, an older adult, uh, to be really enlightening because you see things as an older person that you didn't see as a 20-year-old. 
Right. Was that also your experience? It was. And, and that was um, when I was studying as an adult, um, I, you know, I was studying things because I was interested in them. It wasn't because I need this to get a degree. It was, I was taking things because I thought they would be enriching in some respect. I mean, there were things I took that I might not have if it wasn't for the requirement of the program, but uh, I was always thinking about how does this enrich my life, make me uh, add value to my life in mm -hmm. some way. And, and you talk about being an older student. I was, uh, I was, but I was probably a neophyte when it came to philosophy. So I, I actually um, um, leaned on um, some of my younger friends for, for help along the way, because they were, many of them had been philosophy undergraduate students and uh, made, had masters. And so I was, I was behind from the standpoint of the the academics of philosophy. I've, I, I would like, imagine I you, you had a lot of reading to do, right? You there, had was, there was a lot of reading. All of that yes. Aristotle and Plato and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. There is a lot of reading, but it was enjoyable. And of course, the professor bring, can bring it alive. And that's what happened. And my favorite professor became my, um, my PhD mentor. And um, I'm still in touch with him. So, um, so here you are, you're teaching, you've been teaching undergraduates since I think 2008. So it's been even a while since you've been doing that. Right. I think a lot of people who are looking at second careers have this dream, oh, it'd be so great to teach and to teach on a campus. Right. And I'm wondering what your experience has been. Have, is, are we idealizing this idea of going back to the groves of academe or <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What's your experience been like? Uh, no, I don't think it's, it, I, it, I resonate with that very much, just the way you described it. it it's um, even when I was, even when I was not in a full-time student, it, when I was a Time Warner, I went back to NYU and took courses and always just, I liked being in the academic environment. I just thought it was a, almost an ideal lifestyle. Um, and I love being on a campus uh, as I am at the Pace campus in Pleasantville, which is a beautiful suburban campus. Mm -hmm. I know it. And I just like the atmosphere of it. It seems like it has all, everything you need. It has... I don't live there. I mean, I probably would consider that there was a, you know, faculty housing, uh, but there's athletic events, there's cultural events, there's of course the, the academics and colleagues that you can share things with and students. And I, I love being around younger people and I don't feel my age uh, when I'm around them as much because I feel like they were, we're, we're engaged in common activities and the things that we're discussing. And I don't feel like that I'm, you know, feel like they're colleagues. And I have a rude awakening uh, when, though I'm maybe talking to some of these younger students and we walk past a plate glass window and I'd say, wow, who's that old guy with these young kids? And I realize oh, that's, that's me. <laughs> and so it kind of takes me down a little bit and say, hmm. You're not fitting in as much as you think you are, Mitchell. So, <laughs> <laughs> do have you? You've been teaching a while. When you think mm -hmm. thirteen years or so, um, have students changed in that time, um, or has the pre the prevalence of the internet made things have they have their priorities changed or their interests changed? Or do you think that age group is, it's kind of uh, immutable. They're always going to be the same. I'm interested mm -hmm. in what you think. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, I haven't seen a big change since I've been there. And I'm, you know, my, our, most of our students who aren't right cutting edge, maybe if I'd been at some places where there was a lot of political activity, there's a certain amount on our campus and we're having events coming up um, next weekend that have to do with social justice and I applaud that but it's not like there's a uh, uh, there's been a big change and I guess social consciousness but I think the students are socially conscious and they have been since I've been there and so I haven't had seen big changes it, maybe if I was at a sur a suburb a, a urban school I might have seen it but I haven't on mine it's mostly students from 
um, tend to be from middle class backgrounds and working class families, and they've um, you know they appreciate the value of education, and they are originally focused some more than others. I say that some of my students are really excellent students, and other students are like I was, just mm. mediocre. <laughs> and they, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I learn from them all, and that's that's really true. I, I learn from them, and I, I love it when we get involved in class discussions, and I feel like the students are engaged, and I truly do learn things from them. So you teach this course called The Philosophy of Happiness, and I know a lot of my listeners are going to be like, okay, let's get to the, <laughs> let's get to the meat of the discussion. What is the philosophy of happiness? What do you think uh, philosophy has to teach us? Well, the philosophy is you know, broken down as the, the love of wisdom, and I, I think philosophy, philosophy of happiness has a lot to do with understanding ourselves, so, Socrates says, know, know thyself. And we, we, um, we, we go through our life learning about ourselves. And it's hard to really look at yourself objectively. But we can learn from other people and the experiences of other people. So the, the first book that we study in my course in happiness is a historical survey. And it's um, in our lifetimes, it's we pretty much had the view that that this life is to be enjoyed and this is this is it even if you believe that there was an afterlife but there's no reason to postpone any sort of concept of, of happiness and fulfillment uh, but there have been periods in history when their the view was uh, happiness is not for this lifetime mm -hmm. this is for earning your place in the afterlife and that's when you'll have happiness and that's just one of the differences that we've seen over the course of history and of course, enlightenment had a lot to do with uh, with uh, our attitudes and dare to dare to know. Sapere uh, ode, um, the Latin phrase for that, um, dare to know, and I that's inspired me. And that is something that uh, dare to know yourself. I think is a big part of it. But you said in your introduction that uh, happiness, and I believe this, is, is related to our purpose and. A big part of, I think, happiness is, and it's happiness may sound like a almost a trite um, objective, but uh, Aristotle didn't think it was, and Aristotle was a pretty serious guy, um, but he used the term um, eudaimonia, which uh, can translate in various things, but uh, human flourishing is one translation, and so, you know, we may not, not always be giddy happy in the sense of like just jumping jump with joy, but if we feel like we're on a path of doing something that is worthwhile and has purpose, then I think we can feel um, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so I think of eudaimonia, it's because we have to think about what it means, and it can mean a spirit guide, it can mean the various things, but it's um, you means good, so good spirit guide. There's a certain amount of luck that comes with it too. I won't discount that, and that's built into even Aristotle's thinking about it, that it's not like there's a pattern. It's like make, baking a cake. You can just come up with ingredients, put them in the oven, the oven at the right temperature, and you're going to have a wonderful cake. It doesn't always work out. You know, things don't go well for even well-meaning people sometimes. And sometimes people that you think don't deserve it seem to have wonderful lives. So it's just one of those, a little bit of mystery and a little bit of um, fortune that's built into our lives. And I don't have any explanation of that, except that it seems like that's the way it is. I, I wonder if- We should if, do the best with what we have. Yeah. I, I wonder if even happiness is not quite the the word we're looking for. Is it satisfaction? Is it fulfillment? Um, having a, a sense of purpose. I'm here for a reason. I'm here, I'm doing good. I've made someone's life better today. Right. I think you're right. Um, and when I created the course, so when I talked to my colleague about it, we talked a little bit about that. And we could have been, you know, the philosophy of eudaimonia, but I think it might not have been as had the same, same attraction for students. I mean, everybody wants to be happy. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's not quite, it's, it's not like a hook that we were trying to trick people into studying something that <laughs> it's not what we're studying. Uh, happiness is certainly a, a goal, but 
but it can be a, a more profound happiness that I think is more worth achieving. And that's something that we get through. I think of happiness that comes from from effort. Mm-hmm. You know, I've satisfaction. Ne- yeah, I, there's, as you say, there are other words that may be even more descriptive of it. What you, we're talking about. You know, I've never, I've never heard the term eudaimonia before, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I'm someone who has an undergraduate degree from Columbia, and I'm wondering how did I miss right. that? Um, can you describe that a little bit? And I, you know, even spelling it is um, is is problematic e u d a i m o n i a and i only know that because i did a little bit of research on you <laughs> right yeah yeah it's a you know i guess the reason i like it because it does stand for a few different concepts but it's uh and it makes you think if you say happiness everybody knows what that is or thinks they know what mm-hmm. it is but if you have a term like this that i didn't invent for sure i got it from Aristotle, and he got it from his predecessors, but it's a Greek term that does have have this, what I interpret as being a, doing those things and achieving those things that we're particularly capable of achieving as human human beings. Aristotle acknowledged that uh, other animals can achieve a sense of satisfaction, but we can only be he believed, and, and I believe that we can only really be satisfied if we're using all of our facilities. We have facilities as humans that we believe that other creatures don't have, and the ability of reflection, the ability to, um, to, to plan and achieve and to find purpose. Uh, most things in the world seem to know what their purpose is. I love dogs, for instance. They seem to not worry about purpose. They mm-hmm. They kind of, they love affection and they love to eat and they love to play. And and so do we. But then we also, I think at our higher selves, we love to reflect and have a uh, plan and have have these uh, meanings in our life that sometimes drag us down because we, you know, we can't figure out what that is. And um, I think it also motivates us to, to, think about when our days come to a close that we can look back with with the feeling that we've done our best. Do you think, um, do you see many connections or, or how do you contrast what you've learned as, as, uh, a, as a PhD in philosophy with your uh, upbringing as a Southern Baptist? And I say this as someone who um, I'm a Presbyterian. I go to church every year, every week. And, mm-hmm. you know, that the idea of, you know, it's go to the Bible for your, you know, view of happiness. To me, that's, it's not very satisfactory. Um, mm-hmm. Like I, we've been looking for the meaning of happiness for thousands of years, really prior to, you know, the Greeks were onto this long before, I think, you know, the New Testament was written. I can't really talk to the Old Testament, but mm-hmm. I'm wondering what what um, what what the com- what the comparison and, and the contrast is with with your um, with your early life being raised mm-hmm. in in the church versus what you've learned now. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in the in the, in the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, and I'm an admirer of the of the ethics that we get, um, most of the ethics, there's some pretty strange things, especially in the Old Testament, mm. but um, that uh, the ethics of, of, of Jesus are quite profound. And if we could all just follow that, if we if we loved our enemies, mm-hmm. <laughs> just think what a, what a world it could be. Yeah. Um, um, and if we could be the good Samaritan and be looking out for the downtrodden and and make those things a priority and not be you think of the story of the uh, passing through the uh, rich man's um, ability to achieve the afterlife is more difficult than the camel passing through the eye of a needle mm-hmm. um, things of those sorts are pretty dramatic if we took them seriously um, so there's a lot to learn from these uh, scriptures. What we don't know, at least what I don't know, and others would say, well, you're just ignorant, um, is uh, the metaphysical aspects of it is 
you know, is it the way it's been interpreted? Is is there a heaven and a hell? And there's a, is there an afterlife? Does it does it uh, require us to um, make a profession of faith in something that you know, some philosophers like Kierkegaard says you have to take this leap of faith. That mm -hmm. almost goes against uh, the the rational mind of a, of a philosopher, but it's uh, certainly uh, don't dismiss it. And I just, you know, people have to find their own way. And for many, I know their faith is is everything. And I would never try to talk somebody out of that mm -hmm. because I think that would be, uh, I would think it'd be if there's such a thing as sin, that would probably be sinful to talk somebody out of their faith. But if you are one that's still searching after, and that is not fulfilling for you, I think that some study of philosophy and the study of great thinkers is, is another way to go about it. And for me, it's been fulfilling. When you look back on your journey from, um, you know, being an attorney, a successful attorney, uh, making this fairly dramatic life change at, you know, midlife, mid-career. Um, do you have advice for others who are thinking of making a similar leap? Well, um, yeah, I guess I have some, some, advice in general and whether you're thinking of making a career move or not but I and I, I do counsel students um, at uh, at Pace and um, I'm the director of the Honors College and have a lot of very bright students that I talk to on a regular basis and I encourage people my students and I would encourage people generally who are thinking who haven't found this you know this is what I want to do with my life and this is it and and I'm still an admirer of those people that come about that naturally, but I encourage people to explore academic and learning opportunities wherever they find them. And if you say, well, I don't know anything about that, that's all the reason to do it, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially if you're an undergraduate, um, to take a course in something you don't know anything about and say, this might be interesting because that could be, that could be a pipe way to something that you want to do more of. And if you don't like it, so be it. You know, when one semester of something is unlikely to to cause any damage, it's um, more than likely to enlighten you. And and kind of leads to, me to another piece of advice is to know the things that you love or like, um, but also know the things you don't like. I think mm -hmm. it's important, as important, to know the things that aren't for you as it is to know the things that are for you. And so if you can start whittling away the things, well, this is a life that I don't want to live, or this is the path I don't want to take, that's, that's instructive, and that's helpful. It helps to narrow down the, 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 uh, the options. You know, college students, I know this is, we're talking to people beyond college students, but all of us, we have, especially that age, in the early, in the late teens, early 20s, making a lot of decisions, making decisions about, that can affect the rest of your life. You're making decisions about your career, and you're making decisions about um, whether you're going to finish you know, your undergraduate studies or go on to graduate studies. You're making many people, I wasn't one of them, but making decisions about life partners. And those are big decisions. They oh, were yeah. big, big decisions at, at any age for anybody. Uh, it's a lot to pack into a short period of time. It's a very impactful period of time for, for people that age and that station in their life. But I uh, encourage people to to uh, to explore and to uh, see what there is to uh, to know about that they don't know about, and not just stick with something that they're comfortable with. So get it out there, out of the comfort uh, zone. Um, I think you and, know, Lynn. I think know. I think one of the toughest things we put on young people is that question. So what are you going to major in? when right. you're really going to college to explore. And right. my experience looking at my younger classmates when I was at Columbia was that pressure to make those decisions. And then you kind of lock yourself in to uh, finishing all those course requirements for the major requirements, and you don't give yourself an opportunity to explore. Or you might take a course, you 
don't want to take a course where you might not do well because you want to keep your right. GPA up. And I think that's right. tragic because this is where you're supposed – when else in your life are you going to have this opportunity <laughs> unless you go back in your 50s and, you know, start all over again? Right. And if you have a demanding job when you're out of school, then you don't have the time to go and, and seek out education. And of course, it's become – you can do continuing ed stops but you know not everybody does that it's not feasible for everybody Mm -hmm. it's sometimes can be expensive and it can be inconvenient but if you're on a college campus what could be more convenient than just drifting over to another classroom in another building and taking something outside of your discipline if you have a discipline and checking it out yeah absolutely (laughs) and yeah so i i encourage people to do that in whether they're back they're currently students or, or not. Um, another thing I advise and I think is important, advise my students and advise others is to find mentors. There are people that are, everybody has people that care about them. And uh, it would be certainly tragic if you didn't. Hopefully everybody has somebody, even your parents love you, Some somebody loves you and cares about you. And that's, you know, appreciate them and, and spend time with them. Um, but seek out other mentors. It's important. You know, you, many of my students come from very loving and supportive backgrounds or families, and certainly there's no way that I could ever replace or, or anybody else the love of their parents and siblings and other extended family. But they don't know the environment that you're in. That's in right. This uh, academic, they don't know the moving pieces, they don't know the characters, they don't know the situations. You develop mentors in your place, wherever it's your place of business, where you're working or where you're studying or wherever it happens to be. Then you have a shorthand of like you have come to your these people you go to for advice and they doesn't take much explanation to say, well, I'm having this difficulty with this professor or this situation. More than likely, they'll have an idea of what you're talking about without having to explain it in great detail. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to develop these uh, develop mentors in every walk, walk of life, not just in school. And I've tried to do it along the way. And as I mentioned, my dissertation advisor was somebody I met when I was over 50 and still I go to for advice. Um, and, and, and not, so it's important, I think, to have mentors. And it's important if people come to you to, to ask you to mentor them is to be open to that possibility to, to give back in that way. I can't think of, yeah, I can't think of a greater privilege than to act as a mentor to a young person because you're really having an impact on their lives. Right, right, right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And the other thing I, it's, is that um, I've developed for myself, when in doubt, uh, uh, go for it. And do it. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not in any way, don't violate any ethical principles or legal principles or unless you're engaged in civil disobedience and there's a, you know, that's can be ethical as well. But generally um, any regrets I have in life are things that I didn't do Mm -hmm. as opposed to things I did do. Um, There are very few exceptions. And I think about a few things I didn't do because, well, it doesn't seem, I'm not sure, blah, 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 you know, kind of wishy-washy. Then I think just do it, you know, unless it's going to hurt somebody or hurt me or, you know, really foolish then just do it uh, somebody recently and this is the only time it's happened a former student who's now a lawyer um, asked me to perform his marriage ceremony in Washington DC and I I thought that's a little crazy I don't have any credentials to do that but I uh, said I don't know if this will ever happen again so I did it and I'm so happy I did it happened two weekends ago and I think everybody was pleased and I um I was certainly happy to be a part of it. And I thought, that's just another slice of life. Uh, and if I said, man, I don't really think I can do it, then, you know, that would have been okay. But I'm glad I did it. And there have been many situations, though, along the way. I remember a friend and year, many years ago asked me to come to his wedding, not to be a part of it, but it was just to be at the wedding. It was it was inconvenience, out of state. It was not. And I didn't do it, and I always regret that. That, mm. that friend uh, passed away at a young, young age, uh, not because I didn't go to his wedding, but, but you know, I just felt, you know, that was something I should have done. I should have been there. 
I, I think this is a fantastic philosophy of life, which is not to box yourself in or to limit yourself, uh, but to embrace those new opportunities, including being interviewed for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great privilege. I, I, I'm really so happy that you asked me to do this. This has been so much fun, Len. I've gotten so much out of this, and I'm sure my listeners will as well. I really, really appreciate your sharing your philosophy of happiness and of life and uh, sharing your life's journey with us. It's It's been inspiring and, and really just wonderful, and I appreciate your being with me today. I'm so happy, and thank you again for this privilege of mine.